A new poll shows Kamala Harris has pulled even with Donald Trump in key swing states. Conducted by Bloomberg and Morning Consult, the poll shows Vice President Harris has erased former President Trump's lead in seven of those states. That includes an eye-popping 11-point lead in Michigan. White House columnist Niall Stanitz joins me to discuss. Niall, nobody thinks Harris is going to win Michigan by 11 points, but what do you make of this latest poll? I think what's important here, Drew, is the broad trend, which is clearly that Kamala Harris is doing much better in polling against Donald Trump than President Biden was doing. So we're seeing her certainly uh, reduce any advantage that Trump had in the polling. I take your point entirely. No one thinks that Michigan is going to be an 11 point margin in Harris's favor. So there is reason for a measure of skepticism here. But as we always say about polls, it's not about one poll, it's about the broad trend of the polling curve, and, and that is clearly going in Kamala Harris's favor, at least in uh, reducing the Trump advantage. After the shakeup at the top of the Democratic ticket, Republicans are honing a strategy to attack the new Democratic nominee. The plan is to go after Kamala Harris's flip-flops on policy positions. Now, Harris held pretty liberal positions during her time in the Senate and as a presidential candidate in 2020. Is that going to come back to bite her? I think it could do, because obviously any charge of inconsistency or of political expediency does have some danger. I think the other thing in Kamala Harris's case is, can Republicans use that to make the argument they're seeking to make that she is in some way uh, liberal uh, outside of the American mainstream. Now, Democrats would scoff at that idea because they don't even see her as on the left of the Democratic Party. And in 2020, there were candidates who were clearly further left than she was, Senator Sanders and Senator Warren in particular. But these changes in position are a political vulnerability. The question is whether Harris can minimize that vulnerability or whether it's something that Republicans make a lot of use out of. And Democrats are continuing their onslaught of attacks against Repu Vice Pre Republican vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance over his comments about childless women. It seems like every day a new video surfaces of Vance saying something negative about adults without ch children. Now, all of the potential VP picks are getting in on the attacks, including Senator Mark Kelly from Arizona. What do you make of him uh, as a potential VP pick? I think Senator Kelly is, has some things to recommend him, the primary one being that he represents a border state and has adopted somewhat tougher positions on the border than have been typical in the Biden administration or elsewhere in the party. Now, the, the question mark around Senator Kelly is, does he lack dynamism? Is he going to excite anyone? Maybe he's not, and maybe that's not a politically fatal weakness. You could argue that what uh, Vice President Harris needs is a safe pick, and he might, he might fit that bill. But uh, he's clearly one of uh, two or three frontrunners for this role. And Democrats are trying to drive this message home, uh, reference to J.D. Vance's position on uh, families, and kind of Democrats are using that issue to uh, plan a vote in the Senate this week. What's that about? So this is really about the uh, child tax credit and a way of, of uh, adjusting or amending that to, to make it more beneficial for families. The difficulty is that without getting too deep into the weeds of it, it seems unlikely to pass. It seems uh, unlikely to get enough Republican support to, to pass the Senate. And so this is one of the sort of messaging bills that we see increasingly in election years, Democrats trying to use it to paint Republicans as, as against uh, things that would assist the economic health of a family. Uh, Republicans obviously pushing back against that charge. With the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the abortion issue is now being fought state by state, but in states where activists are organizing to put the issue before voters, they're meeting resistance from Republican lawmakers. Republicans have sought to prevent abortion protections from going before voters in Florida, Arizona, Arkansas, and Montana. Does this undercut the argument from some Republicans, including President Trump, that the issue should be left to the states? Well, it certainly seems to be a position that is in tension with that Trump position. 
I understand the politics of it, which is that ever since Roe versus Wade was overturned, we have had a number of statewide ballot measures, and the liberal side has won every single one, and the conservative side has lost every single one. So the abortion issue pretty plainly plays to Democrats' advantage right now. That's presumably why Republicans don't want these kind of measures on the ballot in November. There is the fear from the Republican side that having those measures on a ballot would uh, boost Democratic turnout and therefore, obviously, boost uh, a potential Democratic margin of victory. And despite Republican efforts to keep abortion off the ballot in Florida, the issue is slated to go before voters in November. A new poll shows 69% support for abortion protections. You can't get 7 in 10 Americans to agree on virtually anything in this country. What uh, do you make of those poll numbers, and what does it say about the politics of abortion, and does it actually put Florida in play at the pre presidential level? So it certainly underlines the importance of abortion as a political issue. It certainly underlines the fact that the Democrats are politically on, or electorally on the right side of that issue. This is a vulnerability for Republicans in just the same way that, say, immigration is a vulnerability for Democrats. Now, in relation to Florida, I'm a little skeptical that that state is in play. Florida is a state that has trended Republican increasingly in recent years. Uh, Governor DeSantis won re-election, I'm going from memory here, but I think by 18 or 19 points. So Democrats want to make it competitive. It's a very expensive state to compete in because of its expensive media markets and size. But uh, certainly Democrats hold out some hope, I think, uh, an ambitious hope, I would say, at the moment. Arizona held its primary yesterday. Democrat Ruben Gallego and Republican Carrie Lake secured spots as their party's respective Senate nominees. Trump made a last minute endorsement. That seems like it may not have been enough. What are your biggest takeaways from the Arizona primary? One thing I think is just that political celebrity does tend to still be effective. And Carrie Lake, yes, she is a very, very divisive figure. Yes, she trafficked in fiction about her previous gubernatorial election being rigged or being subject of fraud. But she still is the biggest name or, or well, probably the biggest name in the Republican Party in Arizona. That was enough to carry her to victory. I do think it's going to be a fascinating Senate race in November because, of course, Congressman Gallego is pretty progressive. Uh, Carrie Lake is very, very conservative. So it's going to be a very uh, clear dichotomy of choice there for the voters in Arizona. RFK Jr. has been struggling to maintain relevance after Kamala Harris rose to the top of the Democratic ticket. Campaign donors are said to be growing tired, and he continues to slide in the polls. While his campaign was largely crafted on dis dissatisfaction with the Trump-Biden matchup, what's next for this campaign with the new energy surrounding Kamala Harris? So I've been a long time skeptic of Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s campaign because he has slid downward in the polls throughout that campaign, even as he has received in some ways an inordinate amount of media attention. I think it is even more difficult for Mr. Kennedy now with, with uh, Kamala Harris as the de facto Democratic nominee, because as you correctly point out, Drew, the whole Kennedy uh, offering was premised on the idea that p voters would be deeply dissatisfied with the two choices before them. I think that's much less certain in a Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump race than it would have been in a Joe Biden versus Donald Trump race. The political leader of Hamas has been killed in an airstrike in Tehran, the capital city of Iran. Ismail Haniye was the, in the country for the inauguration of Iran's new president. While Israel has yet to comment on the strike, Hamas has blamed Israel for the attack. This attack is a major blow to any ceasefire talks and will likely lead to retaliatory attacks from Iran. Does this have the potential to lead to a broader regional war in the Middle East? I think that's the danger. I, I mean, this is a very difficult one to talk about in some ways, because obviously, as the political leader of Hamas, Mr. Haniye is an enormously controversial figure, and I'm sure lots of people will be quite happy that he's gone. On a political uh, level, though, Israel, uh, presumed to have assassinated him, is clearly an escalatory measure, an escalatory action. And of course, it comes at a time when there are enormous tensions 
conditions on Israel's northern border between Israel and Lebanon. So yes, I think it does increase the dangers of a wider war, and I think it, it vastly decreases the chances of a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel. We thought that that ceasefire, or we were told, I should say, that that ceasefire agreement might be getting close. I was always fairly skeptical of that because I never thought Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel wanted it. But I think that ceasefire, uh, the possibility of that ceasefire is much more distant now. All right, that's all I have. White House columnist Niall Stanage, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. The director of Project 2025 has stepped down. Paul Danz has announced he is leaving his role at the Heritage Foundation after facing intense criticism over the conservative blueprint by former President Trump. Project 2025 made national headlines after its release, showing a 900-page plan to reshape the federal government and be a guide to the next conservative administration. Trump has been working on distancing himself from the project as Democrats continue to try and tie the former president to the conservative think tank agenda. Donald Trump's nephew is breaking from his family and endorsing Kamala Harris. Fred Trump III says he is voting for Harris in November and will campaign for her if necessary. The former president's nephew made the remarks on The View Tuesday, calling his uncle atomic crazy. Fred and his sister Mary have been outspoken critics of the former president, with Fred going as far as to say his uncle's handling of issues is complex and sometimes cruel. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland is defending his appointment of special counsel Jack Smith. Garland spoke out on Judge Eileen Cannon's decision earlier this month, throwing out Trump's federal classified documents case. The judge ruled that Jack Smith's appointment was unlawful, but in an interview with NBC News this week, the attorney general noted that he was a federal judge for 20 years and would not make such a basic mistake about the law. Garland also referenced a series of cases saying up until now, every single court, including the Supreme Court, has upheld special appointments, adding that he followed the same process as was used when John Durham and Robert Mueller were appointed as special counsels during the Trump administration. Special counsel Jack Smith's team is appealing the ruling, but Judge Cannon's ruling effectively shut down any chance the federal case could go to trial before the presidential election in November. That's today's Daily Debrief. I'm Drew Petromo. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel, and come back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.